Emmanuel is an autistic 25-year-old black man who lives in Sweden. Two years ago, he had a meltdown and the Swedish police was called. The police pressed charges against him and Emmanuel was sentenced indefinitely in the Swedish psychiatric hospital Kashuden. This is a maximum security hospital that house very dangerous people, including murderers and rapists. When his family was asking why an autistic person is sent to such institution, the doctors in charge of Emmanuel decided to cut the visits. This is according to Emmanuel's family. Last time they saw him was back in December 2020. According to Emmanuel's family, they are not allowed to see him anymore because they're documenting how he's been treated. Emmanuel's family claimed that one of the doctors who's working with Emmanuel is claiming that they can cure autism. But the thing is that autism is not a disease and there's no such thing as a cure for autism. The doctors refuse to explain to the family what is this treatment that cures autism about. Emmanuel is being punished and overmedicated and has even had COVID. Now, the doctors are cashewed and have cut Emmanuel's phone calls with the family, alleging that the mother is toxic and aggressive just because she's fighting for her son's rights. Mango Podcast interview Emmanuel's sister and mother, and they explain in more details what's going on, including their struggles with Swedish authorities and doctors. Due to COVID, we recorded the interview via video call, but unfortunately, the audio of the interview got corrupted. The parts where I talk didn't get recorded, so I will only include the family speaking, which I think is the most important part of the interview, since they deserve to be listened. Very hard. And then finding one that has already been created to, is very difficult, because like I said, a lot of the black pages in Sweden, they don't like when you use the word racism, because Sweden is like a taboo to talk about race. It's just all about saying how being a black in Sweden is about talking about having the best life, not talking about actually what the experience that you have faced. And so it's, it's very, it's like, it's really difficult to really get a black page. But concerning the lawyer, we have been trying to get a lot of lawyers. Like I said, we have, I think we have like mails and messages that we have spoke to some lawyers. But the lawyers here in Sweden are not really willing to touch the case. Like I said about how the policy of, law, of law, the lawyers here in Sweden works. It's more like the state is paying majority, you understand? So most lawyers are really scared to get involved. I've seen people that have even contacted us that are lawyers, and then we send them documents, and then we start chatting with them. And then all of a sudden, they just stop. And then you call and call, and then you discover that they have blocked you. And I said, but you contacted us. You wanted to take the case. And then we start giving you evidence and documents and proof for you to follow up the case. And then you turn around and block us. Rather, you should be more interested, because with more evidence means you're able to build up a case. So it's like, it's not really, it's very like really hard to get a lawyer because I've seen cases like we have like, we have found ourselves in positions like that. No, but what you said was right. That's why I even started documenting Emmanuel. If you look at his post, you see that I mostly put tapes of talking to him or talking to the suite. And I used to put that because to when I like, I remember like in 2020, I was in California. And when I was there, I discovered that when you tell people you're coming from Scandinavia, you're coming from Sweden, there's that thing that people look at you like you're some kind of like celebrity. Like you have, I remember one of the most common things that people told me is you don't have to face the racism that a lot of black people face in America. Now, when I start talking about Emmanuel, and then they're like, Oh my god did they do that to your brother is that what they did and it's true it's very difficult that's why sometimes if you look at emmanuel's posts i mostly post i will record them and then i put it out there because it's very difficult to tell somebody that is scandinavian or sweet can be racial but it's easy if you can like put them listening to let them listen to them being racial because maybe that way i noticed that when i started putting their voices the page started growing more because people started listening and hearing the sweets being racial and they're like this is serious. It's, you're not just telling us. We're listening to how abusive they are. So I kind of like understand where you're coming from. It's very difficult sometimes to, to talk about racism when we're talking about Sweden. Or Even the petition that I had, I noticed that the people signing the petition, they were not Swedes. People refused to sign the petition, but the thousands of people who have signed those petitions are not in Sweden. 
And then so one one guy told me that he met my son in Kashugin, and my son is not supposed to be there. That he will sign the petition, but he will not share the petition because he's going to lose privileges. I was shocked. He said, of course, I'm going to lose some of my privileges. So you, you, it's something that when, when we started 2019, everybody was like, no, I told these guys are the best. I told they had this. I told they're doing a magnificent job, a wonderful job. So it takes time, but I like the way people are more open today and they want to say, no, let's not just accept that. Because it, the, the nicest guys are still those ones keeping people in their basement. So we should at least go deeper. Why did they treat him this way? Why are they doing this? Sometimes I will even write because I love writing. Ah, I don't really talk more. And somebody will just go under and write propaganda. Then I will bring the document written in Swedish. Sometimes I try and translate it. I say, is it propaganda? You can look. You can call Kashuden, you can say you want to talk to Imawa, you can talk of Jana Villain. You, I can tell you all the disability kings workers have been in my son's life. I can tell you the director of psychiatry who decided that Imawa should leave Helix to Kashuden. I can tell you the judges. I can tell you the different doctors that have been in my son's life. So it's just the complete racism in the healthcare, in the police. And then the public servants have excessive powers. The doctor will tell you that your son ever had a good life. A lot of powers. She just insulted me on the 29th in front of the director, your grain, asking me that has your son ever gotten a good life? If he has never gotten a good life, must you throw him in cash then? This is a human being for crying out loud. So the insult very soon will call, even though we have been banned, to see if we can even they can allow us. You get the insult, they will insult us. You feel like, oh my God, who does this to another human being? I do cloth, the leather pool. I mean, you're just so rude. I just, I do. I, I worked in Cameroon before moving to Sweden. You don't do that even in Africa. You'll be sanctioned. If people keep complaining to, about your boss on attitude, I think you will get some sanction. But yeah, nobody cares. It's just like it's our normal thing. Yeah, it was really nice. It's really nice. So uh, we'll think about the issue of the lawyer and then we'll get back to you. Yeah, we I think we try 60 minutes Australia. We have contacted I'm some the, you I'm, I'm following the Guardian, but I'm not really official. But I think I'm not reaching to the Guardians because if I did I wouldn't be here. That the ban or that's why that's what we started asking and then the ban us because when they said that we're seeing some doctors out of Sweden, so they said to us, It's strange that Swedish doctor will say they have a cure to autism because the truth is that autism is a spectrum, there is no cure. So when we were asked the doctor Jana Villain that, but how did you come across your own treatment line that you're claiming to have? And then she gets really agitated, really irritated, and then she bans us that we can we have to there's certain things that we are not going to ask. And I said, But if you're going to be a medical doctor and you want to cure somebody, don't you first of all sit the families of the patient and the patient and explain to them how the treatment line is going, the process of curing the patient and so on. You don't just... No, I think that... I think the... No, I think the curing thing is a way to keep him more in Kashuden because if they say they are going to cure him and then they keep him longer in Kashuden, pretending to cure him. So because when he went to Kashuden, my family kept asking, but why is he in Kashu then? He's autistic. And you, like you mentioned, the one of the people that were accused of killing Olof Palmer was kept in Kashu then. So, it's a, a, so it's, a, it's a center that is meant for aggressive criminals. And Emmanuel is not a criminal. He's an autistic boy. So how do you take an autistic person and blend with aggressive criminals? That means at the end of the day, you are not out to help the autistic person. You are out into rather finding a way to use him so when my family started asking but how long is he going to be kept in cashew then because this is not a center first of all meant for autistic people and they came out with a theory how they will cure his autism that's why he's kept in cashew then they want to cure his autism and then i said but how did we go to the point of start curing autism because autism is not a curable thing it's not first of all a disease to start with you cure a disease you don't cure something that has nothing to do with the disease and that is when my family discovered that we should start documenting the treatment because when we look at the treatment they will belt him they will lock him up they will tell him how if he has his meltdown he has to follow rules yeah i'm like this is autistic person how do you go and tell an autistic person that don't have a meltdown don't, don't don't be aggressive don't have a compulsive behavior if he doesn't have all those things and then he's no longer autistic so that means you're finally taking away the autism and that's when we started documenting the argument put several 
never taped on his Facebook page and Instagram page where even Emmanuel himself is talking about how when he has his meltdown, he's been belted, he's been locked up. His doctor tells him how if he has to leave the facilities, he needs to promise the doctor that he has finally been able to get away from his autism. He's not going to have his autism uh, compulsive behavior and things like that. He has barely ever left that facilities. He's locked up inside the facilities. I even made a video where I stood in front of the facilities. You see how the facilities is being fenced. Everything is fenced. Everything is mapped up. You cannot leave it. So he just like putting him in prison and then forcing him to to take away the autism, which is something that that's why my family started documenting that is this is not treatment. This is harsh. This is inhuman treatment in this 21st century. You cannot do that to a disabled person again with all the tech of knowledge out there about disability. And, and he gets so frustrated when he cannot keep these rules and regulation, when he cannot do this, when he cannot do this, then they punish him again, then they tell him that he had just gone back to the last day. So the stress is so much, and this is somebody that there was one time he was running around the train tracks. So it's just getting the sleeping and getting the feelings that one day he would jump down and kill himself. It's, let me tell you, it's 80% that they can tell me that a man will finally die, which is very, very bad which is very, very bad because the, the stress he has to go through, he doesn't know why he cannot see his family. But what <clears throat> I've noticed to the bottom line is not like only ego, it's our children are welfare commodity. Emmanuel, when Emmanuel moved with us, they defund us from every help. But Emmanuel in this place every day is costing the government 8000 something so but when he is in a in, at home you don't want to give him that help meaning that our children are welfare commodity you take a child from the parents that they are this they are that and you give him to a foster mother and you pay this foster mother to take care of that child and then you don't prepare this mother that you are claiming that is toxic for this child to come back it means these children are they're, they're like a welfare commodity. They're like a, something to create jobs for people who don't want to leave their home and go and work and they want to work from home. So it's another form of modern day slavery. Because you don't prepare. If I say you are toxic, you cannot carry out your parental duties, then I take your child. I should be struggling to make sure that you come on your feet. And that is how we came up with the death of this little girl, Amanda. And that politician came and said, Lila Yata. There's nothing like Lila Yata. If you think this mother is on drugs and has, and doesn't, she doesn't have the capacity to take care of a child, once you take the child, you should prepare this mother. And before giving back this child, you should make sure that the mother is able to carry out have parental duties. You cannot go and prove a point by giving a child to a mother who cannot do it, and then the child is dead, and then you punish the mother, and then the social worker and the court who took that decision, they're going court free. And so that is the situation. So I started getting cases of mothers telling me that they dropped their child in school before you know the police is there in police handcuff, that the children said this and said that. And nobody tries to investigate whether the child is just saying it as a child or maybe had a bad day with the mother. They just take their children. And so a lot of misery. I don't think any mother will come here and learn the Swedish language, do a assistant nursing, and then cannot take care of their child. So that's another area in social works where racism. So I decided to become a social worker because I saw what a, a social work is helping vulnerable and oppressed. And then this social worker is the one promoting racism. Then we, we are dead gone. That's the only reason I'm dedicating my studies to my son, that somebody needs to be a voice out there. And for me to be that voice, then I have to study. That's why I refused the admission in Swedish university to study the social work in Swedish. Let me study in a language where I'm comfortable that I can use it to advocate. I think the only, I think the only thing that I want people to do is spread awareness because it's not only about Emmanuel. We we have if you look at the Emmanuel's Facebook page, my autism journey for, on Facebook and on Instagram, you see that you have seen the different levels of torture that he has gone through, and not only him, but also my family trying to fight for him. I remember I made a post where I said I was my iPad, my phone, my my uh, I was taken from me by the Swedish police, claiming that it's not legal to document or to film and all that. And these are some of the things that they do to a lot of black people here, which makes it very difficult for black people to talk. Because when you start expressing your abuse in Sweden, like you said, it's a taboo to talk about racism in Sweden, but not because people are not racial upon, but because most often it's coming from the Swedish system. So when you start expressing that racism, instead of the government taking responsibility or trying to investigate it or trying to put an end to it, they come up with new strategies and plan how to 
force you to accept the racism. And that's what we have seen with Emmanuel. And that's why, for me, the, the whole journey with Emmanuel is not just all about giving Emmanuel justice, because it's also about a lot of other people to learn, like Emmanuel, that they are, that are being locked up and their families too are having a really hard time in Sweden trying to get a voice or trying to get some kind of justice. Because like you said, people have, have, have this ideology of thinking that Scandinavians are not racial, Swedes are not racial. But the truth is that they have not even lived in Sweden or they have not even lived in Scandinavia. So they don't even know some of the things that people face inside these quiet countries here that are not talking. And that's why I wanted people to see that sometimes the quietness in Scandinavia and Sweden is not just quietness. It's quietness based on abuse that people are being forced to be quiet because if you, if you don't keep your mouth shut, you go through what my family has gone through. Recently, I've been talking about how my family has been banned from seeing or talking to my brother. And why did they ban us from talking or seeing Emmanuel? Because we started documenting how abusive they are towards him. So instead of the government in Sweden changing their policies and looking into the investigation, that been, how did an autistic, autistic boy end up being abused? They rather ban the family so the, the family doesn't document it. And then it makes it look like we are quiet. There's no abuse going on. But not that there's no abuse, that we have force the people to be quiet and then we continue our torch on the people and that's why I want this whole thing with Emmanuel to create awareness so not only Emmanuel gets justice but more people too can also get justice and people can have some kind of break through, to break through yeah, and break justice through. can be served to a lot of people. I've seen so many because more with Emmanuel's case, I've seen a lot of people that have also spoken this, that Swedish government has done similar issues to them. You even mentioned some of them on when we we're talking. So you know some cases, I mentioned some cases, we talked about Emmanuel. So there are several cases of black people that have been abused here in Sweden. And you even talk about the fact how public servants in Sweden have enormous power that they just use when it suits them. And the government does nothing about it. So how many black people are in this kind of circumstances here in Sweden? Where they, no, I, the, the thing is that the, the police station that are claiming how Emmanuel is aggressive or that resisted them. They have they have been called they have called them several times when Emmanuel has had an episode is meltdowns, but they did not press charges. But this particular incident, they pressed charges. So it was all about like you already you're already aware because he lived in that place. That's where his address is. So they know him. Because every time he has this meltdown, sometimes when it's too much, they call the police and then the police comes. So why this particular incident? Why did we make it out of it? Why did we take it into something into a big deal that there was nothing all about him? Yeah, Emmanuel, you know, with autism, he has this episode where when we just moved into Sweden, he was almost like running away. He would be, be like out. He can just stay in a place and they will ask him to leave. Then he will not leave. He just gets talk. Like one, the one of the case that the police, they are even facing charges. He was in the same room and in the same room, it was about time for them to close. And then they asked him to leave and then he didn't leave. And then they started an agitation with the guards. Okay. You, the police, I think, and the social workers, they're forgetting the part that we have applied for a personal assistant for Emmanuel on several occasions and they have refused. We've even made a complaint to the courts and they refused. So it's like they didn't want to help Emmanuel, but Emmanuel should live in a facility that they will be the one controlling it. So if Emmanuel doesn't live in that institution, then they will teach us a lesson by putting him in the worst institution, meaning that our children are made for the institution. Whether they like it or not, they will be forced into those institutions. I have a... I have series of documents that we started applying for help, and that help never showed. And when you make a counter complaint to the court, they will not, they will say the, the what the social worker said is okay. And this is somebody that gets stuck in a place, like the guy that the police shot Eric today. If you get stuck in a place, it's only somebody that can help you and say now it's time for us to go. And if he doesn't want to go, the guards will have to push him out. And he doesn't know that if they push him out, he will go. So he will start like resisting. So it's the point of the police officers to contact, as they used to contact Anika Yakigot or Maria Johnson, who was the social case worker, and say, you need to do something to help this boy. Because, yeah, instead of taking him and going and punishing him for being disabled, you should be talking to the, com the county. You understand that this this is an individual that keeps like is everywhere. We cannot keep having him here and there and here and there. Instead of so you're punishing me for not being able to walk, and then the system that should help me to help me see how I can walk go cut free. That's what has happened to Emmanuel. So Emmanuel is a victim of the system, 
and the system is just yeah he, he, uh, that is it you're just telling us that as black people you are not supposed to talk you are not supposed to like ask that this yeah because why are you punishing him if he had the help that he asked for then this like dr master man wrote he needs help so you don't want to help and when you ask doctors to write the doctors will write the uh, um or what he needs. Then they'll go on there and say, and leave mama according to the mother. It's not according to the mother, it's according to the situation you are saying. The only doctor that has succeeded to write the really good uh, uh, doctor's report is one doctor in a feature psychiatry. And they were very angry why I took it personal and went there. So they have their doctors. I noticed that my son has different doctor's report. When a doctor report leaves the Swedish system to the court, like they're looking for conservatorship, you see a different story about my son. But if you ask for a doctor's report, they give you a doctor's report like another different whole issue. So it's more of a system. This person is smart person and has to live in my institution. So if the family comes to take the child, then all hell is breaking loose. Because you are taking an object that I'm using for my paycheck. You're not take, they don't see him as a human being. They see him as a paycheck. And that's how our children are being seen. So the bottom line here is racism and money. Somebody who is my paycheck is gone. That's just all. That's just all what all hell is breaking loose. And so they have to teach us a lesson to back up. Because there was one time this last home took him to me shopping and say he will go he's going to start living in his shopping i said but we are planning that he's no longer going to school the school is also complaining he goes to school and he's sleeping because of excess medication huh? because of excess medication so why can he not come and then like try to do something else with the hand so we contact a care and they say he can come and start working but they never liked it so the, you don't your opinion as a mom doesn't count. You don't have any right to say everything. You just stay quiet and let them do what they want to do. So no, we went for person. We, we asked for personal assistance, and the county that was the first several occasions we have asked they refused. The last time we asked, we were given one hour seven minutes. How mm -hmm. one hour, seven minutes, and I have to go to work. So I started begging my families and relatives and friends to help me take care of Emmanuel. And this is your know, people have to pay bills because I also have to go and work. And nobody wants to know the part where the social condition of Emmanuel, who takes care of Emmanuel, how is Emmanuel living? You only keep sending us letters that you should appear and see the investigator, you should go and see. A, a mental health evaluator, he should see a forensic. I'm the one taking him for a medi to see his doctor in autism center. I'm the one taking him from all doctor's appointment, dental appointment, every appointment. I have to skip work and I will, will know we, nothing was being paid. The, the social worker mm -hmm. made sure that every help was deducted if he doesn't live in another living facility. That's it. Right. And if we continue, he will live in a worse place, and that's how he find himself there. So our children, yeah, a welfare commodity. I even made a complaint to fall back in Sweden, the management court in Sweden, they said no. I made a complaint to Kamaretten, and Kamaretten did nothing to make sure Emmanuel's right was, Emmanuel got the help that he needs. Yeah. Uh, four months ago. Four months ago. I spoke to, I st uh, six, the, I was, I started, I lastly saw him on the 25th of December, 2020. Yeah, so I st on the 21st of January, the doctor banned me from uh, talking to him. And the doctor banned me till March 21st. His birthday was the 12th of March, and I was only allowed to talk to him for five minutes. And uh, then the doctor allowed me to start talking to him again on the 18th of uh, March. And then on the 6th of April was the last time I ever spoke to him till today. And I've been, I've been on Kashudan on two, three occasions. That even some, uh, he, he lives with me, so he has to get some allowance and other things that you need to apply as he goes from 21 to when he's 25. I applied and the... The social insurance, uh, what we call for Shesikasa, asked me to take it to him so that he can sign because he doesn't have uh, 
a good man or a conservator. So I took it there to sign. They said they will show him for him to sign. When I came back, they said he refused to sign. Then when I left, they, they, I was told that he had a corona. He was tested positive for COVID. And I said, okay, let me try and talk to him. They still refused. So the, so the, the hospital counselor started going around in other public offices and removing the power of Anthony that I kept there as a mom. So I'm not allowed to see him. I'm not allowed to talk to him. The doctor even is avoiding me. They started like ghosting me on the 7th of April. On the 6th of April, I was last time I talked, 7th of April, they started ghosting me. I never knew why nobody explained to me why up till it was, I think last month that they gave me the reason and, and the reason was still toxic and I allowed and this okay yeah okay going through with the mother can be stressful so what do we do do you ban the parents continuously from talking or do you get them help because the child wants to talk to the child to the parent and the parent wants to talk have a relationship with the child so you see how they can make a platform or you just use your ego as a medical doctor and keep banning the family so the bans now is going to take till august and after that we don't know whether she will continue banning so as a medical doctor, you're working with your ego, not for the best interest of your patient. Yeah. I don't, I never gave him autism. They said I'm loud, I'm toxic. I don't know how I'm toxic because I'm also seeing other psychologists. Okay, tell me how. They, they also ask me, Becky, ask this doctor, how are you loud? How are you toxic? It's my culture. I mean, when you push somebody to the wall, every day you call, you have the right to say, but what's going on? The doctor doesn't want to talk to you. I should not be the one going after the doctor. The doctor, before taking such, such a drastic decision, you would have at least informed me that, okay, you know what? I've seen that you're enabling this autism or whatever, so you will stop talking to your child, or maybe you will talk twice a week or so, and then we'll get you some help, and then see how you can reunite and start to, you just ban. And that, that 20, because you said we where you talk we put it on the media and the whole world is seeing it so your problem banning us is not because we are actually toxic it's because we are putting it on the media so we should not talk to emmanuel because if we are toxic yeah good and fine every parent parenting and uh, especially a child is going through one or two stress so how do we come become better to have a conversation with emmanuel you cannot keep banning all the black parents that they cannot see their children it means you are acting on your, it's like you're not, it's power. It's more of power or there's something you're trying to hide. And in my way, if you really think about your patient and your patient, the best interest of your patient is what is at stake, you will not ban us. Yeah, I just want justice. I just want justice, not only for Emmanuel, for everybody. Justice needs to be served. Nobody deserves that. Our children don't deserve to be tortured to death. Here they don't. Thank you very much. Thank you for really trusting in us. Thank you. Yeah, I hope we have another session like this. Yeah. Thank you. So you might be wondering how to help. Well, follow their Instagram account where they have been documenting the situation in detail. Also share and tag organizations that work for people with disabilities and black people's rights. Emmanuel has the right to proper care instead of being treated like a dangerous criminal just because he's a disabled black man. The family want answers and to have Emmanuel's rights respected. Racism, ethnicity and race are often ignored by the fields of mental health and special education, which makes non-white people more vulnerable against racial bias and racism when trying to access this type of services. Since Whiteness will always be seen as the default definition of human due to colonialism and white supremacy. This conscious exclusion of that discussion is racist. Sweden took this a step further by taking an extreme position to the misguided I don't see color approach and make it law. As I have mentioned in previous episodes, this approach makes it almost impossible to collect reliable data about racism in Sweden. However, we know that black people are more likely to be harshly punished within the psychiatric field not only because of racism but also because this also operates from a cultural logic. Back in December 2020, Habin Brane from Eritrea was killed by the Swedish police. 
Habin had intellectual disabilities and mental health issues, and according to neighbors, he was non-violent. No further investigation was made against the police, and also back in 2018, the Swedish police fired 25 shots at Eric Torell, a person with Down syndrome who was playing with a toy gun. The police officers were acquitted. Systematic racism and ableism are a reality, and if we don't discuss them, then we can't protect ourselves and others. Thank you so much for listening. I will upload the interview part separately on my YouTube channel and podcast platforms as well. We need your help. So please, please follow their Instagram account, share and help us to spread awareness. I also have a short summary of the situation in my Instagram account too. So please, thank you, thank you, thank you so much for listening. Again, I'm going to upload the interview part that is in this episode separately if you only want to listen to the interview. And thank you so much for listening and see you next time.